Welcome back to the penultimate session of this year's forum, where we'll be joined by a selection of social entrepreneurs and impact investors who will share their experience on fundraising and investing. Um, so I'd like to welcome our moderator for this discussion, Tom Mastroboni, uh, the Chief Investment Officer at Big Idea Ventures, and his panel, uh, Adesua Rhodes, founder and managing partner of Arua Capital Management, Harit Sony, the founder of Equilibrium, Michelle Edelman, the founder and CEO of Asite Holdings, and Shelley Aronov, co-founder and CEO of Innerplant. Uh, so over to you, Tom. Thank you, Tom, and hello, everyone. So great to be here and really excited about this great panel that we have uh, assembled here for you. Um, really interested, wanted to kick off with Adesua and get her view on you know, as, as a fellow investor, we see a number of deals, variety of founders and opportunities. And how do you apply your filter to really get down to the ones that you want to spend your most amount of time with and ultimately the ones that are going to receive some of the capital that you manage? Yeah, thank you, Tom. So hi, everyone. I'm Adesua Kumbo Rhodes. I'm the founder of Aurora Capital Management. Uh, we're an early stage growth equity and gender lens fund investing in Nigeria and Ghana. Uh, we invest with a gender lens, so we invest in businesses that are either providing essential goods and services that improves women's lives. Uh, we see the female economy as an untapped $15 trillion opportunity, so we're very excited to showcase opportunities there. Um, and we're also investing in businesses that are either founded, co-founded, uh, or led by women or have gender diverse teams, uh, because we strongly believe that gender diversity will help to um, improve profitability of our businesses and will also help to maximize social impact in our communities. Um, so for us, what do we look for in the businesses that we're investing in? Uh, for us, first, it has to be a sound investment case. So we are typically looking for businesses that have proven their business model, uh, that are already generating revenue, that already have an existing demand for their product or service, uh, already have a route to market, uh, already have really validated uh, what they're looking for growth capital for. Um, uh, and we want you know, companies that have a clear proprietary technology, a clear barrier to entry, uh, where our capital, we're pretty sure that our capital will be going towards scaling that business up where they can pass that inflection point of growth. Um, in terms of our impact lens, we're, we're pretty much focused on, I would say two of the SDGs as our core objectives. Uh, first one is obviously SDG 5, which is gender equality, but we're also very keen on SDG 8, which is uh, decent jobs and good economic growth. So with the growth capital that we provide, we want to make sure that there are clear employment opportunities and job creation uh, opportunities from our, from our capital. Um, so th this, that's something that we're very, very conscious about. You know, is this management team that we're backing first, is it a diverse management team? First, is it, a, is it a management team that values uh, gender diversity? So they're not just, you know, ticking a box, but they strongly believe, you know, there's that value alignment where they strongly believe that if they're able to have gender diversity in their workforce, in their board, across their value chain, that, you know, it would be a, uh, it would be a more um, profitable business where, you know, diversity of thought and, and decision making will help to, you know, have a more rounded and more inclusive work environment. Um, so that's something that we're always kind of looking for. Uh, so it's, uh, I think fundamentally, you know, having been investing in Africa now for, for a very long time, the, the key thing we're looking for is really an alignment of interest with our uh, entrepreneurs uh, and values alignment. Uh, because, you know, they obviously have to pass our investment criteria and our investment case. But I think that to, to have a successful investment you have to have a uh, value alignment with uh, with whatever entrepreneur that you're backing. Um, so that's my that's my take. That's great. Thank you. And Michelle, you're also investing in Africa. It'd be great to get your point of view on this as well. Yeah, um, thanks, Tom. Um, so um, uh, Excite is uh, an impact mission driven investment um, firm. But what we do is we actually build businesses from scratch. Um, so what we found and what I found when I first started investing in Africa in 2012 was there was a real gap in the marketplace in terms of the types of businesses I wanted in to, to build. Um, so our investment criteria was around how do we use technology as a catalyst for change 
to create a new business that will create net new economic activity in the marketplace where it doesn't exist before. Um, how does ideally using that technology that is sustainable and renewable and isn't damaging the environment, you know, we don't like to dig things out of the ground, um, and that creates jobs for youth and women. So very much aligned with the DUSA in that regard in that we believe that by investing and in creating jobs for um, women, we can create a much broader social impact because that money trickles down into the economy. So, you know, as I started to try to look at um, a portfolio of businesses back in 2012, when I started, I realized there actually didn't exist anything. <laughs> um, and so what we really started to do is build our own and incubate our own businesses, get them to a point where then they could attract the appropriate investment capital. So, you know, when I said, you know, I want to build greenhouses in the desert in Botswana and grow fresh produce using hydroponics, right next to the consumer, people are like, well, you're mad. <laughs> so we're not giving you money for that. Um, so, you know, I had to build it right before anybody became interested. When I said, you know, three years ago, we want to be the leading plant-based food distribution platform. We want to bring Beyond Meat and Oatly and Just Egg to Africa. And Africans are going to love this and they're going to eat it. People are like, you're kind of crazy. <laughs> so, um, so that's, that's, our, that's our philosophy. And that's how we've been going about um, building our businesses. That's great. For, for the record, I don't think you're crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I think those are very interesting and very necessary projects. So thank you. Um, I want to flip the question a little bit. Um, and Shelly, as someone who seeks capital from investors, how do you gauge which investors are the ones that you want to do business with? And how do you decide which pools of capital you want to bring into your company? Thanks, Tom. I think I, I'm not used to being the odd one out, uh, but in this group I am. So I'm based in California, um, fundraising in kind of the Mecca of all of it in the Bay Area. My, uh, so my two cents on it is that it's really hard to vet your investors in advance. And there's a lot of these stories around choose who you're gonna work with. Well, many times it's luck. I've been lucky twice already, but I do think it's luck that you end up meeting people and within a month you figure out that you can work together. It's unlikely, um, but what, in, choose what's important to you. So for us, our number one lens is find someone that doesn't want to sell our company into the incumbent. Because what we are, more than a lot of other things, we're trying to create a change in agriculture and do that by creating competition, especially for seed technology, because the consolidation that has happened over the last five years is really bad for farmers and the environment and pretty much everyone involved. So I'm very vocal about that. I go out to the world like right now and I tell this to investors as well. And I tell them that we're not interested in selling our company to the big agrochemicals and we want to stay an independent long-term business that could have strategic alliances with other companies, but not necessarily with the handful of companies we wanna compete with. Um, I've got a lot of advice from people that have told me, you need to look more flexible. Tell them that you're willing to always entertain any opportunity, and I think you don't. Um, I know exactly what we want to do for our business, and I think this is the way to create the most value and impact for the world and farmers. So we just put it out there, and we tend to vet the people that are maybe not interested in the same long-term vision that we have for the business. So I think if you really care about something, just put it out there. Don't be afraid, and you're going to pretty much kind of get rid of everyone that's not interested in your vision. That's tremendous. We, we deal with a lot of uh, first-time founders at our firm, uh, and one of the things we try to tell them is be authentic. Um, don't try to be someone you're not, because eventually, you know, the facade will fall, and we will see the, the real person that you are, and that's the person we want to invest in, uh, but it's always great to have that going in. Uh, certainly, last but not least, Hari, love to get your perspective on on what Shelly just mentioned. I saw you nodding along and uh, want to see if you had anything to add to this to this topic. Thanks, thanks, Tom. Um, you know, it's it's interesting for me because I started fundraising around nine years back in India when the investor ecosystem or the startup ecosystem in India didn't really exist uh, the way that it exists today. Uh, I think through these nine years, I've seen India transitioning from a very traditional economy, which was um, led by family-led businesses to today one of the largest startup ecosystems in the world. Uh, so, you know, 
we kind of started our journey in 2011-12 and we were in the sustainable business, which was a very new area back in 2012-13, right? Um, and we just started off wanting to solve a problem which was around energy optimization in the country and, and kind of implementing technology around that. Uh, luckily, we actually got a very initial funding from an incubator in India, uh, followed by a very large institutional investor, which was IFC. Uh, IFC happened to do one of the smallest investments ever of a million dollars in equilibrium way back in 2013-14. Um, followed by a few VC uh, rounds coming in and uh, most recently having a small strategic and family funds coming in. Um, I think our fundraising journey in India was primarily revolving around what is the easiest form of funds available. As, you know, as Shelly said, it's a mix of luck as well as what the market really is looking like. But if I could change it all around today, if I started you know, starting a company today or maybe a couple of years back, what I think I would do is uh, look at um, family funds, uh, and, and I'm, you know, I, I know there are VCs on the call right now, but I would look at family funds who are strategically aligned to uh, my direction of sustainable uh, business uh, as my first choice, and having a smaller investment from a large strategic investor. I would like to uh, kind of, I, I think the reason I'm also saying this is that through our whole journey of institutional investor to VC to family and strategic, uh, our strategic investors have really caught us good amount of revenue. One of the strategic investors actually gives us 25% of the revenue that we do today. Uh, and it's a global investor. Uh, so if I were to look at it, my initial years of the journey, I would look at maybe a few family funds who gives me the flexibility to kind of work around in a long-term patient capital along with a small strategic investor with somebody who can give you business. So at the end of the day, you want traction in the first three or four years, uh, followed by possibly a VC uh, investment later on, because that's when you have traction, the right amount of funds uh, to scale up globally. Um, and initially, at the end of the day, you need to give an exit to the VC. So you have five to six years of traction to potentially give an exit. Um, and then at the later part of the VCs, when I'll bring, bring in a strategic investor and give them a big chunk because that's closer, closing to an exit, you know, if we go by the same cycle. So that's what I believe it's, it, it, you know, today and what I went through in India uh, throughout the whole cycle. So, yeah. That's, that's terrific. Thank you. I, I want to flip back to the, to the investors, uh, to Deswa and, and to, to Michelle real quick. When we think about, I'm a traditional VC investor, I'm focused on financial returns. Um, sustainability for us is a nice natural byproduct of the alternative protein space that we invest in. Um, but for you all, it's, I, I think that equation is flipped and I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. And to what extent are your investors, I'm um, certainly they wanna make money, but how much is it an equal footing or is sustainability and impact a much higher weight in your equation? Yeah, I mean, I can just talk for uh, myself, I mean, it's um, we we certainly when we're you know building businesses and and investing in our own startups we certainly are looking for a financial return. I mean I think it would be kind of silly to be starting a business that you didn't think was going to make any money. Um, and but we are taking quite a bit of risk because we're breaking ground and doing things that haven't really been done before. So as much as you can study your unit economics and build your forecasts, um, because there's no real benchmark, it's very difficult to guarantee that return um, or guarantee that break even point on that timeline. So I think we're much more patient um, in that regard. So we certainly look at the financial um, uh, fundamentals. We look at unit economics, we, we build, you know, long-term forecasts and we, you know, we don't start and invest in those businesses until we believe that there is a you know, a reasonably good chance that you're going to see some sort of economic outcome. On the other hand, we won't invest and build things that we don't believe align with the key principles that we want to achieve. So when it, whether, whether it comes to environmental sustainability, food security, employment of women, um, if it doesn't tick some combination of those boxes, it's just not important to us. So um, it is a balance. The financial returns always have to come first and, and if, if you want to have a commercial outcome and have something that's going to work over the long haul. 
Yeah, I think I think I would echo that as well. Um, I think the beauty of the African continent uh, and what um, spurred me anyway to leave my uh, comfortable desk at JP Morgan in London to come back to Nigeria to pursue impact investing on the continent was I believe it's the last place in the world where you don't have to choose. Um, I, I think you can do both very, very seamlessly uh, just because of the, of the, of the um, construct of where we are in, in, our, in our stage of development or in, in Africa, um, where we still have relatively low um, penetration of goods and services. We still have relatively low um, you know, things that we take for granted. So, you know, usage of, uh, you know, basic consumer goods, you know, we've, we've invested in a business that provides local, uh, that, that provides uh, and locally manufactures a range of sanitary products and baby diapers and baby wipes. And you'll be, you'll be amazed at some of the statistics in terms of usage of hygiene goods in Nigeria compared to developed markets. Um, so I think for us, financial return is, is as Michelle said, that it has to make sense from an investment case perspective first. Uh, we have to be comfortable that we're going to be making an, a, an attractive financial return. Uh, and our returns actually stand shoulder to shoulder compared to any other traditional fund. But the beauty with the African continent is you can do both. You can have you can make a 5x return on an investment and still create 100 direct jobs for people in rural communities that, are, that otherwise wouldn't have employment opportunities. Uh, you could make a 6x on an investment and be providing access to basic hygiene goods for women and babies in rural areas that otherwise wouldn't have access. Um, so that's the beauty, I think, of the African continent is you can seamlessly invest with purpose and make profit. Um, and I think that um, I think that you, you rarely see that in other parts of the world, um, but I am biased, <laughs> but, uh, but I think that you rarely see that in other parts of the world where you have to pick and choose. I think with Africa, just because we have, you know, we still have so much to do in the development of our youth, of our women, uh, of our, of our, you know, our direct uh, and indirect workforce system, um, that as we as, you know, capital providers, as we invest, we're actually helping to, you know, create employment, we're helping to provide access to basic goods and services, we're able to provide access to power, we're able to provide access to nutrition, to water, um, whilst still making attractive returns because there's also a scarcity of capital on the African continent. Um, so I think when you balance those two things, you can invest, uh, uh, you know, and do good and do well. Um, I think that's that's what excites me about investing on the on the continent. You don't have to pick one for the other. Right. Thank you. Um, I, I want to switch to our to our entrepreneurs real quick and and ask you all to be a little vulnerable for our audience and, and maybe share some stories of fundraising approaches or strategies that you you tried and didn't succeed. Um, you know, how quickly did you pivot? How important was it for you to pivot? Um, and, and sort of what takeaways do you have from that that you could share with our with our group? Hey, Shelly, we could start with you. You know, honestly, Tom, I was thinking about that question and uh, um, I wasn't, I think the fundraising that I've done was fairly successful, I would think. And I was lucky that it didn't drag too long. Um, but I did remember as you're saying the question right now. Um, so <laughs> last year around March, I suppose, I decided to start fundraising when I was eight months pregnant and no reason for this right it makes no sense but i do think that there's if there's <laughs> there's some female founders out there you might find yourself in a weird situation we weren't running out of money by any means that's the other weird thing it's just that um, i had a plan and that plan got derailed a little bit and i decided that i'm going to stick to it and it's going to be okay and it was a really stupid decision so don't fundraise when you're really pregnant and don't fundraise right after you have a baby because none of that makes sense <laughs> by any means uh, but for some reason, I was even getting advice from people and no one just would tell me straight out, this is a really bad idea. 
there's uh, for some reason, maybe they didn't feel comfortable to, to say that, but I couldn't get anyone to tell me this is a really bad idea. And probably a couple of weeks before I really kicked it off, I thought, this is a crazy idea. I need to stop it. And even then it really took COVID happening around the same time to be like, ah, this, this is not a good time. Um, so I guess this has happened to me uh, in a couple of ways already. Um, I'm about to start fundraising in January. I really wanted to kick it off this quarter and the quarter ran away from me. So I would say as long as you have enough money in the bank and you really sh should, by my advice, have enough money in the bank to plan um, comfortably your fundraise, then just don't get too tied up to what you plan. That happens to me. Maybe it's my personality, but sometimes I just get into motion because I had this plan in my head and you just have to adjust. Um, that's, yeah, bad idea, fundraising when you're pregnant. Thank you. Thank you for that. Harin, how about you? You know, I'm, I'm going to expand on what um, Adesua said about this, the mixing of profit and purpose and, and, and um, how actually it helped uh, bring the purpose thing back to ease the fundraising, right? So we traditionally started our company as being an energy management and a predictive maintenance company, right? So we had built an IoT platform and we were doing a lot of analytics on top to save maintenance costs and energy costs for large corporates around the globe. Um, cut to around three years back when we entered the market. And we started talking about the beautiful tech that we built and you know, the, all the savings that we'll be doing for our customers. Um, and we realized the, in, the response is good, but it's not like, you know, fantastic, right? Um, so we kind of changed uh, pitch a little bit around one and a half years back. We didn't need the money, but we wanted to raise the money for good people. Uh, and we realized that the whole sustainability aspect of it, while we were delivering a lot of energy efficiency and sustainable impact for the customers, we weren't really talking about it. Um, so when we actually changed the pitch to say that we are going to help our customers reach sustainable prosperity, that's a term that we kind of brainstormed over a couple of glasses of beer and said that that sounds interesting because that's exactly what we do. It's bringing sustainability, but also bringing prosperity for our clients. So we save money as well as bring in uh, impact. Um, and we, we Took the whole fundraising approach around having sustainability, sustainable prosperity as the center of it. Uh, when we bring in profits for the customers, we bring in, um, you know, help the people who are running the factories with the tech we build, uh, as well as, um, you know, kind of help the planet with energy efficiency. And that really resonated with the, with the investors. Um, and interestingly, I, you know, we just, you know, closed a large round of funding from American and, and British investors uh, around six months back. Um, and, and I think what is really happening in the world is when we are fundraising, um, the investors know that it's not just about profit, but you have, if you have a sustainable story, there's a very strong consumer sentiment, which is driving business towards it, right? Um, and I'll tell you another story what's happened. We are talking to one of the largest uh, auto component manufacturing companies. They have 80 manufacturing plants across the world. Uh, supplying to Honda, to Toyota, and a lot of other places. Uh, the owner sits in, in London. Um, and, and he told us around a month back when we have a meeting with them, he said that my buyers, which are these large auto companies, have given me a mandate that if you don't have an ESG roadmap and a sustainability impact story over the next five years, they are going to stop buying stuff. From me, right? So I need you to help me bring in the technology which will help me meet my sustainable growth plans, right? So what's happening slowly is that the whole uh, consumer sentiment and the government focus around in the Western world is slowly trickling down to the suppliers in the developing world who now also need a mandate because for your scope three reduction in, um, in the, in the, in the uh, reporting matrix, you need your suppliers also to have uh, sustainable uh, development. So I think it's a really exciting time for anybody who's raising funds um, while I know that profit comes first, but if you just focus on profit and don't have a sustainability story, it might actually not work for you. So every business needs to have a sustainability story. And that's what I think will make uh, fundraising slightly more easier for people. That's great. Thanks very much. Um, wanted, to, wanted to switch gears back to investing for a moment. Um, and this, this is actually... I'm asking for a favor for me, but I think it's great for our panel too and for our audience is um, we have a company that's received 
two competing offers, one from a corporate investing entity and one from a financial sponsor. And the management team is trying to decide, they're still early stage, trying to decide, you know, which one should we take? Should we be, try to take both? I guess for the, for the financial investors, for this one, for Michelle, how do you view strategics coming into your, your portfolio companies? Do you see it as a potential benefit, a potential risk? And how do you weigh that when it comes to follow on investing into your companies? Yeah, I mean, I think that some of it is driven by the entrepreneur um, and who that entrepreneur is and what their experience is, right? So, because, um, you know, if you are a first time entrepreneur, you're not a seasoned business person, um, you know, it could be that that corporate investor who comes with infrastructure, right, comes with processes and systems and access to, people and expertise is the right marriage to your place in your personal evolution as a business person and as an entrepreneur. Um, and it could be, you know, so I think part of it depends on where are you as the entrepreneur and the founder, you know, in your own business life cycle and what is the kind of support structure that you need around you in order to be successful, right? Do you, Kind of feel confident you've got the management team you've got the vision you've got the experience and what you really need is capital or do you need access to not just channel but people and expertise and infrastructure to help grow the business and i think that's a really big decision and i think it's very individualized based on more on the entrepreneur as much as anything else um certainly as well from a business perspective i mean i think the one thing that we all hope when we bring investors to the table is that they're going to hope help open up channels they're going to provide relationships, they're gonna create connections. You know, having that corporate investor who has, again, an existing customer footprint and potentially uh, existing channels to market can be very valuable. But on the flip side to what Shelley was saying, you know, it also comes with risks because, you know, that corporate investor may push you down a path off your vision, off your long-term mission, because once you're tied to that corporate investor, you're now tied to what their financial goals and metrics are, which may be different than yours. So I think it's a very delicate balancing act. I think it's very individualized. And I think you've got to look at it from both a business perspective and from an entrepreneur perspective to try to make the right decision. Yeah, so I think I, 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 think I, I would agree with that. I think we welcome strategics into, um, into our portfolio companies in terms of follow-ons we actually have a strategic that is coming into a series a round of one of our um portfolio companies because i think that strategics can sometimes offer a pan-african reach uh that we may not be able to offer um so you know they might have operations in another country that you can partner with uh, they may be able to have access to best practices that you you know that you might be able to glean from. Um, so I think that um, I agree with Michelle. It depends on the entrepreneur. But from my experience, um, when strategics come in, there is a there is a kind of a value proposition that is um, kind of far-reaching beyond just you know your country of operation. Um, and I would also add to that that sometimes. I guess that's the pro, the con <laughs> of having a strategic uh, is um, when I think about exit, you know, the, 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 the ideal exit in terms of, you know, maximize value sometimes will come from a strategic rather than a financial investor. So it's kind of weighing the balance of not having strategics in too early, which may then limit your exit options even further in a, in a continent like Africa, where, you know, the IPO market is pretty, um, limited, um, so it's it's trying to it's trying to weigh the balance of when exactly should the strategic come in. Uh, yes, it's good. Yes, it's good for your business, but you don't want them to come in too early, where your potential exit could then be, um, you know, restricted. Um, so I would say that's kind of the pro and con from from our experience. Great. Well, that, that lines up with what we told our, our management team. So I'm, I'm glad I don't have to backtrack and tell them something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's always like, a good sign. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Be happy they're interested, but be careful. Um, be careful of people bringing gifts to your party. You never know. Um, 
So I just want to let the audience know we're, we're, we got about uh, 13 minutes left on our, our timer clock here. If you all have any questions, please feel free to pop them in the chat and we, we can put them in front of our panelists. Um, what, wanted to um, get towards our wrap up questions here and, and ask the entire panel, what do you think needs to change on both sides of the table uh, to really help drive impact investing globally? Um, is it a matter of being more open to that balance between impact and financial returns? Um, or does it have to be binary where we have a group of impact investors and we have a group of financial investors and never the two shall meet? Um, so for, for the whole panel, love to get your both, all the perspectives on that. I can hop in. I, I, I think I think purely financial investment um, is drawing to a closure in the next few years. I mean, it's a bold statement, <laughs> but I, I think a pure financial investment, which has no sustainability aspect linked to it whatsoever, um, will see a slow decline for the years. Um, so I, I personally feel that if um, and it's always going to be a mix between a, a fine balance between profit and purpose. Uh, but purely profit, I don't think, is going to work in the next few years. Um, and that's my uh, view of things. Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts as well from the investor side. Um, and pure uh, purpose, again, doesn't work because at the end of the day, we all live in a capitalistic society. So we need uh, the profits to come in for the, prof for the investment to keep happening and, and innovation to continue. So, you know, I, I think it's it's going to be a fine balance between the two as we go ahead. Um, I, I don't think it's going to be pure profit uh, in the near future. And that's my uh, you know, thought. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I, from my perspective, I mean, I think it's really challenging and it's different if you're talking about emerging markets or whether you're talking about mature markets. Um, and, you know, I think Africa, India, South Asia, I mean, I think there's a lot of really interesting emerging markets where, um, you know, profit and purpose uh, put together can create, you know, a whole that is bigger than the sum of the parts. But it's also a very, um, it's also a very cutthroat environment, right? So, you know, it seems like in Africa, for example, you see one extreme or the other, right? You know, you're either seeing, you know, hardcore, you know, financial driven investors that really don't care about social impact, environmental impact or anything, or you're finding people who are much more socially responsible. And I think that's so great to hear what um, uh, Asua is doing in Nigeria, right? Because it's really trying to find that right balance because um, there's perfectly a lot of players in Africa that are really after profits at the expense of everything else. Um, so um, I, and so I do think that opportunity very much exists in, in emerging markets, and that's why I spend you know all my time um, investing in African emerging markets because I feel like that's the place where I can make the sum of the parts equal something bigger than than you know than the whole. Yeah. So I I think on my side. Um... I think it's really just continuing to showcase success stories um, uh, and give and giving more examples where we've been, you know, where you know players have been able to achieve this balance. Uh, because I think that there is just this misconception that to truly maximize impact, you have to sacrifice return. So being able to showcase the stories where they go hand in hand very, very well. I think will change, hopefully change that misconception of impact investing. Because sometimes impact investing, you know, when you say you're an impact investor, it's a bit of like a dirty word <laughs> uh, that you're not, you know, you're not, you're, you're, you're obviously an investor that's not, you know, looking to attract, you know, a generate market rate return. So uh, I think that if we have more success stories uh, and if we're able to have more examples and really build the rhetoric that, you don't have to sacrifice returns to be an impact investor. You don't have to, um, you know, um, uh, you know, limit, uh, you know, the the what you're trying to achieve, especially in a continent um, like Africa. Um, so I think that to, to 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 make impact investing more sustainable, we need to have these success stories, because if you're not making money at the end of the day, it's not going to be scalable. Um, so so that's a really big. Um, focus of what we're doing it's 
it's being very, very intentional about showcasing the, you know, job creation, showcasing tangible women economic empowerment outcomes, uh, and showcasing what, you know, the trickle down effect of having women in decision making roles can have in our portfolio companies. Uh, but to scale that up, you need to make money. So always making sure that we can show that um, that balance and show, showcase success stories to change the misconception in society. I mean, I, I suppose I can add one more thing, which is from my perspective, I kind of flip it, which is it's our job as entrepreneurs to figure out how to create impact alongside building a strong fundamental business. So and especially when I think about VC in the Bay Area, we're talking about really massive returns, which means every business should have high revenue opportunities, a really large dam, uh, really high gross margins that usually makes for, for a solid fundamental business, um, network effect, stickiness. You can build that into your business. That's the core to build a potential, you know, really big return for the investors that could return the entire fund, which is what they're looking for. Uh, alongside that, build your impact. And I don't think it's necessarily either or. For us, it's been 100% aligned. What's better for our customers is better for the environment because it means less human intervention in the way we think do things today now. And that, by definition, creates value. So just find a way where you can grow your business in the right way, create that business that people want to invest in, and then also have your impact built in. Hopefully, there's always a path. That's great. That's great. We've had a couple audience questions come in. So I want to get to those before we wrap up here in the last few minutes. Um, one of our attendees is asking for, and this is probably for our entrepreneurs on the panel, um, which platforms have you found have been the best to use to reach out to investors on? And, and once you've connected with them, what's the best way to conduct diligence on your potential investors? So I mean, you can use LinkedIn, uh, of course, but uh, investors prefer introductions. So do go and find someone that they know, get a warm introduction um, in case you don't know the, it's best if you get an introduction from a successful founder, next in line would be maybe someone that they know and you know admire, your existing investors are good, but obviously if they're gonna introduce you, it's because they, you know, they have vested interest in your business. So that's gonna probably be at the lower end. Um, our approach for business development, and you should view investment exactly the same. It's a sales process, have a pipeline and swarm people. If you're talking to an investor, I recommend having other people reach out from their network. So it feels like a lot of people are talking about you. That's a really good effect that you're creating. Um, so yeah, that's, that's in a nutshell, my approach to reaching out. That's great. Hurry, anything to add there? I think the best way to get investors, the investor approach you. <laughs> so, so the way to get an investor to approach you is to is to get as much um, of the good stuff that you're doing out in the open, um, and have a really got, you know strong PR strategy about what is the kind of traction that you have in this company. Uh, my real advice would be that if you want to get a good deal. Uh, which typically means that you need a couple of options on the table <laughs> and you need a couple of investors to give you options. Um, you need the investor to come to you and, and explore more, more what you're doing. So our approach you know, is, is marketing as much as we can do uh, out in the market about the impact that we're creating or the kind of product we're building or what we've already done um, and, and let it be whispered in the right circles and the investors come to you. So I think that's, that's the best thing that's worked out for us. Along with, of course, uh, you know, the things that Shelly mentioned, which was warm introductions uh, from existing, you know, known founders or known people. I, I think these two things combined, but the first thing, uh, which is let the investor come to you, is what I would propose as the best deal for a potential offer. That's great. Thank you. Ahari, this one's going to be for you. Um, this is from Kinley, um, who's coming to us from Bhutan, and is sharing some of the challenges that they're having due to some regulatory frameworks and raising capital and wanted to see, uh, given your experience, you know, what sort of regulatory barriers have you faced, if any, and how did you overcome them to get, to get as far as you have? So I think I just saw the question, and, and I think Bhutan is at a point where the startup ecosystem is very, very nascent, uh, which is the case in a lot of countries around the world as well. 
the easiest, uh, you know, the best form of capital is getting seed capital from, uh, and I don't know what's the status in Bhutan right now, at least in India, I can speak about the fact that uh, there was a lot of seed capital available even 10 years back, which was from uh, educational incubators, uh, business incubators, uh, who were willing to give a little bit of money for, for getting the initial MVP and getting the initial traction in. Uh, so that's probably the first bet, which is getting uh, angels and, uh, and incubators to invest in. Angels exist in every country. Um, they might not be investing for sustainability, but they're investing for profits. Uh, so angels are the first bet. Uh, which in a, in a country which doesn't have a startup ecosystem, which is very mature, uh, followed by a little bit of a post little bit of fraction is when I would look at international uh, investors coming in. And um, very honestly, if the country doesn't support from a regulatory perspective growth, it might be worthwhile to explore setting up a headquarters outside the country. Uh, you know, if you want to set up a headquarters in Singapore or in uh, in one of the European countries to just get the capital there and which can be flowed back into work in Bhutan. Uh, that is another way to do it as well. So I think these are two things that can be explored. That's great. We, we only have two minutes left, but I do want to get to one last question because it's coming to us from, from an MB100 winner. Uh, and, and apologies if I mispronounce your name, but here Rizvi is asking, this is for, my, for the investors on our panel. Um, what do you think is the wisest strategy when you talk to companies raise as much as you need when you can, or raise what you need at that moment in time? I would, uh, again, <laughs> it, depends on, it depends on the situation, but um, you know, if you're on, if you, what do they say, a bird in the hand, um, yeah. So, you know, if, if you're able to raise the money, give yourselves, you know, and, and do it at a valuation, um, that you feel comfortable with, it's much better to have the cash in your pocket. I mean, fundraising and going through the process, it's incredibly time consuming. It takes a lot of management, time and energy, frankly, away from running the business. So um, if you've got a good investor and you're going to raise maybe a little bit more than you think that you need, I would go for it because it, if it avoids your time and energy having to go back to, the, to, the, to do the process again, uh, that's, that's a win. Yeah, completely agreed uh, with Michelle. Um, I would, I, I guess we're we're not talking about debt or equity, so not not to get into too technical, <laughs> uh, but try and raise your equity um, early. Uh, don't raise too much of it, <laughs> but raise at an attractive valuation, um, and then if you can get access to you know cheap debt later on, then that's something that you should probably think about. Um, but completely agree with Michelle, especially in, in, in somewhere like Africa, fundraising can take anywhere between six to 12 months, if not more. Um, so you only want to do that once or a couple of times maximum. Um, so raise uh, as much as you can, as long as there's an attractive valuation. And with that, um, that concludes our panel. I want to thank my panelists. Thank you so much. I want to thank the MB100 crew for the opportunity and we hope you all found some value in it. Tom, back to you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, and thank you to our to our panel, uh, Adesua, Harrit, Michelle and, and Shelley. Some brilliant guidance there from, from both sides of the table. So I hope that was useful for everyone out there. We know that fundraising is always one of the biggest challenges that our, our entrepreneurs face. Um, we'll have one very, very quick break. We're running a few minutes behind. So we're gonna start back here soon for the final session. Uh, measuring impact. How do you know you're making a difference? Um, so see you soon.